who are you? I'm Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen, welcome back to Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Thank you so much. Good to be here. 55th in Maine. That's where I grew up. 55th in Maine, uh, 30... The two block, 33 blocks from here, yeah. <laughs> we are at Neptune Records. We are, 22nd in Maine, yeah. And I have a gift for you to welcome you back to Vancouver, an ODB picture disc record. That's amazing. Wow, this is absolutely incredible. Does this turn and play? It actually goes on a turntable. And how do you do it? You put it right there. It just spins and that's all it does? Yeah. <laughs> that's the well, it plays a song. Does it play a song? It does. And- With a needle in. I see. There's grooves. Wow. And that is for you, Seth, because you. you love the Wu-Tang, don't I you? Do. And I literally, rem- I used to buy CDs at A&B Sound on Southwest Marine Drive, and I I'll never forget the first time I laid eyes on the old Dirty Bastard uh, album cover because I thought it was incredible. And I was a huge Wu-Tang fan. I was like, old DB had his uh, own solo album. <laughs> That's amazing. And you were actually tear gassed at a Wu gig? I was. I was. Um, I was tear gassed at a Rage Against the Machine and Wu-Tang show that was in Long Beach, I want to say. Uh, yeah, maybe 10 years ago or something like that. Yeah, a riot broke out. They start burning things and they tear gas the crowd, me included. Yeah. Seth, I was also curious was your mom a cashier at Woodward's? What? She totally was. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. There was a Woodward's in Richmond where uh, in the mall, in the mall that's now uh, Richmond Center, I want to say maybe. And uh, yeah, she was a cashier at the Woodward's when I was a kid. And I would go hang out. Did they have a record label? They sold records. They sold records, and they made their own sleeves. But your mom was a cashier. My mom was a cashier there. When I was a kid, I would go visit her. It was uh, it was fun. I remember very vividly. <laughs> yeah, that's so weird. How do you know that? Did I say that one time? <laughs> you are Seth Rogen. We have to know. We have to know. And I was curious, your relative, your relative Passenger 57? Yeah, one of my relatives produced the movie Passenger 57. Distant relative. He would be at our Passover Seders. And he was maybe one of the first like links to Hollywood that I technically had. I couldn't tell you his name, to be 100% honest. That is but, pretty cool. Yeah, but what I do know is that one of my relatives, yes, did produce Passenger 57. You also have Z95.3 stickers in your room? I do. I Wow, that's so weird. So my grandfather was a plumber. And... He gave me a toilet for my room as a chair. I had it as a chair, and I like covered it completely in Z ninety five because they they were they would give out like stacks and stacks and stacks of them, and so I took like hundreds of them and plastered a toilet. Yeah, in Z Z. What my phone's on? Sorry, in Z ninety five point three uh, stickers. Yeah, Seth Rogen. Yeah. For your early years, yes. you did ten years of karate. I did do 10 years of karate at the Jewish Community Center. With Sean? Sean Ho. Holy, he worked at Safeway. That's who worked at Safeway. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, Sean Ho was my karate teacher for years and years and years and years and years. I haven't seen him in a long time. And Malcolm kicked you in the eye? Whoa, that's so crazy. Yes, Malcolm did kick me in the eye. And I lost vision in my eye for like 24 hours. And I think my parents took me to... uh, our friends who were like an ophthalmologist, <laughs> it's so weird, and to make sure I didn't like permanently lose vision in my eyeball. But yeah, Malcolm, by the way, was like a full grown man. And I was like 14 or 15 years old. And he was like in his 30s. Yeah. And that is pretty scary, isn't it? It was very scary. Yeah. It was horrifying. But uh, I was pretty sure I was okay. My mom, you know, when you have Jewish parents, they tend to overreact at times. In Seattle, age four, did it all begin there? In Seattle. T.J. Roberts. T.J. Roberts. She was our friend. Whoa. Did she, we went to Seattle with her. At and you four. told a joke. I told a joke at the border. At age four? Could have you told a joke at age four? <laughs> what would you tell at age four? Is it, uh, it was, is it involving a banana? I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe. There's a, a story that my parents regale me with to this day that we were driving to Seattle uh, and across the Canadian border, and I don't, I don't, I take their word for this. And our friends were there with us, and 
they ask you at the border, do you have any fruits or weapons? And apparently I said, we have a banana and we're not afraid to use it. Uh, which uh, apparently elicited a huge laugh coming from a four-year-old child. But uh, maybe that was the first joke I ever told is, we have a banana and we're not afraid to use it. Ba-boom. <laughs> ba <Ba-ba-boom. laughs> Quote, I am Seth Rogen and I am a former... <laughs> a lot of things. What? Play... Playgirl centerfold model. That was one of my wow. That was one of my opening uh, stand-up comedy lines. I'm Seth Rogen, and then I would say I'm not, but I am Jewish. But what is wild is you were on the cover of Playboy. I was on the cover of Playboy, and it actually all kind of came true in a way. It, <laughs> What's the penthouse in Vancouver? The first strip club that you went to? Yes, it was. The penthouse, uh, yeah, they uh, and Evan threw up all over me um, the first time we tried to go there, but I eventually made it back <laughs> another time. <laughs> yeah, I have a gift for you from a Point Grey alumni. Whoa. The history of the penthouse nightclub. That's amazing. That's crazy. And if you open up, you will see pictures of Sammy Davis Jr. Wow. and Frank Sinatra. The whole history of your first strip, strip club. club I ever went to. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Wow, Sammy Davis. It's been there for that long? It and has. It was a strip club. Yes. Wow, I didn't know that. They also shot a Snoop Dogg video in there, which, again, was pretty cool to me as a child. <laughs> so you picked a good club. I really did pick a good club. This is amazing. Thank you so much. You also picked up a porno in Chinatown? <laughs> I did. <laughs> the first, wow, the first porno. <laughs> I was I was in a play at the Chinese uh, like community center. I could not tell you why, how this happened, um, and I was waiting to get picked up by my parents. And I looked down in the gutter. Everyone finds their first porno. I feel like people leave it out there for other people to find, to stumble upon. But I literally looked down on the street. And it was a rainy Vancouver day, and there was what could only be described as like a pile of porno, like like as though someone took a magazine and just like slammed it on the ground in a pile. And I just literally like remember looking and just picking up like a wet handful of like porn magazine pages and just like shoving it in my jacket, and then. Like a crime, like like a, like I was recreating like a crime scene in my bedroom. I remember like laying it all out and drying it, kind of curing it almost, um, and that became the first uh, pornographic material that I ever owned. A gift, a gift from the Chinese gods. Yes, <laughs> Seth Rogen. I would like to go all the way back to grade. Eight. Oh my god, it's my point great high school yearbook. <laughs> this is terrible. And if we could open up to the marker, the, the first marker there. First marker, this is You went sick. to Point Grey. I did go to Point Grey. You are called Point Grey Productions. We named our production company Point Grey. Right hey. there. Seth Rogan. Uh oh bad, look at me. I'm a little punk. I love the hair. I've dyed blonde. I've bleached blonde. I have blonde hair. <laughs> I was big into uh like grunge. I was into grunge. I was they called me a skid. That was like the category at the time. I was a skid. Well, and uh, well, yeah. what's amazing is look at the favorite group. Yeah, Wu-Tang Clan and favorite movie Pulp Fiction. And if you think about that, we're we're fucking like 13 years old and our favorite movie is Pulp Fiction, which is like pretty advanced for that. And uh, Wu-Tang. And Wu-Tang. What's that you? What's that you? We all liked Wu-Tang Clan. Like the whole my whole class Everyone loved Wu Tang Clan. We like, I remember, yeah, like it, it, like at different high schools, different bands are popular, and it, clearly that's so weird. I would have never, <laughs> would have never guessed that, but clearly at my high school, Wu Tang Clan was the shit. And if we turn to this marker here, what do we see? An afro. Oh my God, that's me, <laughs> and that's Kyle. Whoa. He's now uh, the creator of a TV show that I'm producing, and I I wrote Sausage Party with that guy. That's insane. You have an afro. I have my hair looks totally crazy. That's insane. I look nuts. I really look nuts. I look back at this, and it's not entirely surprising that I did not uh, have more romantic relationships in high school. <laughs> what I find really confusing I is full on afro. You played rugby too. I did, and I was pretty good at it. There I am, right there. I'm making kind of a coy face. 
<laughs> this is crazy, man. I haven't held this thing in my head since... 1996. I was big. Like, I was always pretty big. And that's why I played rugby. And I did karate. So I, like, weirdly wasn't afraid of, like, pain and, uh, just physical kind of confrontation. And so I liked a sport where I could just like slam my body into people as hard as humanly possible. That was my drama teacher. Everyone had a crush on her. And if we turn to the last page here, <laughs> Seth Rogen, crazy, going through your grade eight annual, <laughs> we <Weiner>. see- <laughs> Wait, Daryl Weiner most likely to invent something useless. <laughs> Mr. Showbiz. I know, I was literally at a wedding with him two days ago. <laughs> what can you say about Mr. Showbiz? <laughs> He's someone that I've known since I was a kid who went on to kind of become a weird interview person who kind of rips you off, I guess I would say, in a lot of ways. But now he sells beer at, uh, you put him out of business, because now he sells beer at Toronto Blue Jays games. Seth Rogen, <laughs> we also have your grade nine annual, Seth Rogen. Crazy. Man. From Point Grey, and if you could open up to the marker. This is unbelievable. What do we see there? Oh, look, I kind of I kind of cleaned up a little bit. It's a little, it's a slightly more uh, together, Seth Rogen. I have kind of a jerry curl, I guess you would say. I have a very tight curl going on. Moose had hit the scene in this year. I still know a lot of these people. This is crazy, man. And this is Seth Rogen looking at his grade 9 annual, but we have the grade 10 annual as well. <laughs> this is horrifying. Open up to this marker here. <laughs> what do we see right there? Oh, man. You in the hat. Me in the hat. There you go. I started wearing glasses. That's so crazy. That's Evan's brother, Dave. <laughs> and Nathan Fielder. And Nathan is there <laughs> with his sharp buzz cut. Why are you wearing a hat? I was in a play. In a toga. It was a one act like to do. It was like a noir. <laughs> it was obviously the combinations of detective noir and Greek tragedy have always been begged to be combined by high school kids. And so we, we, we tackled that challenge by making a <laughs> rinse the blood off my toga <laughs> was the name of the one act play. And Jesse? Jesse Crookshank, who also was on our improv team, who went on to actually uh, get success um, hosting things as well. Uh, she also hosted New Year's Eve Fail. The greatest thing of all time where uh, her and Jamie Kennedy hosted like a New Year's Eve show where Bone Thugs and Harmony performed and swore a lot and essentially got bleeped out and then a fight broke out at the end of it in the crowd and Jamie Kennedy's last words go, there's a fight, it's ending with a fight. <laughs> it was amazing. All these people in your high school. I know, it's really weird. I'm sure Malcolm Gladwell would have a theory about that. But I don't know what it would be. And again, going through the annual with Seth Rogen, we turn to the last page right here, and we see right here... Improv team! There we are. Me? Nathan wasn't on it this year, I guess. Maybe he was on it next year. Adrian McMorrin, who went on, who's a musician. Ryan Smith, who works. And Ailey Dolgan. Wow, that's so crazy. And they spelled your name wrong. They did? Seth Rogen. <laughs> And also, there's a tiny little write up here. The annual staff would like apologize for the excessive amount of cheesiness demonstrated in this write up. But due to the unfortunate truth that this club horrendously failed to submit a write up, we were forced to create it ourselves. Once again, we apologize for any suffering. That's so amazing. And they spelled my name wrong as a oh, Seth Rogen, Ryan Smith, the gung ho spirit that skyrocketed the team to fame. We did win the BC Improv Championships. Though. Congratulations. That is amazing. It is pretty good. I appreciate it. And right across here, Seth Rogen. Rogan, the Jew Crew. The Jew Crew. Not an official. That was an official club at our school. Matt Switzer, Dave Goldberg, Joey Simpson, and Dean Elterman. They were four. They're sort of four cocky Jewish guys. I don't think they would allow that today at a public high school. Do you? The Jew Crew. <laughs> the Jew Crew. The Jew Crew is so cool. Words can't even describe our coolness. So cool. We don't even have to do a write up. This is why people don't like Jews. <laughs> Vancouver, BC. Vancouver, BC. Point Grey. Point Grey High School. Absolutely incredible. Seth, yeah. Wiz, Snoop, yes. Cheech, and Chong. And I have a gift for you some Vancouver weed history at Cheech and Chong Records. Yes. With rolling paper still in it. Oh, wow. That's incredible, man. This Tommy Chong is from Vancouver. He sure is from Vancouver. Some rolling paper. That's amazing. Did it come like this? It originally? did. It actually came it with this. Giant, giant, giant rolling Very paper. Very rare. That is incredibly Some rare. Some Vancouver weed history. That is amazing because I, my, my mother actually had 
this record, I think, but not with. But she must have smoked she it. She smoked the rolling paper probably while I was inside her. And some more Vancouver weed history. Jesus Marijuana from 69, recorded by Orville Drop in Vancouver. Really? Jesus Marijuana. Is this like one of the more early, overtly uh, marijuana themed things that was out there, do you think? From Vancouver. From Vancouver. That's incredible. Where was this recorded? I- I'm not sure exactly, except in Vancouver. Vancouver. <laughs> Some Vancouver weed history. We've always liked weed here. I think it's all the draft dodgers that came here. <laughs> did you go to a weed buffet in Vancouver and in a laser show? I did. On Actually, really close to here. Maybe 14th and Fraser, I want to say. There was a house... We're in a basement that did not look. This might <laughs> did not look entirely dissimilar from this. You would pay money, and on a table like that, they would set up a weed buffet, and it was a weird collection of people. It was like I think it cost ten bucks to get in, and you could hang out as long as you wanted. And we we went there a few times. It was called Strangers in the Night, I want to say, and. Uh, jaw with a j- strange jaw, get it? And then, yeah, and then we went to the planetarium at Vanier Park and saw a Pink Floyd laser show, which they used to do there, uh, I think, every weekend. And then I remember, I'd, like, people would, we'd see people there who'd be like, wow, like, we've been doing this for 30 years and the kids are still getting baked and doing this. Thank God. And I have a gift in honor of that for you a child's garden of grass all about weed. That's amazing. A pre legalization comedy. Wow, that's shitty weed. What is this? A child's garden of grass. The history. You love weed, yeah. don't you? I do like weed. Acquiring marijuana. General effects. Creativity. This, this is crazy. That is your next movie right this there. Is my next movie. It's from 1970. A few weeks before harvesting time, the weird becomes filled with the excitement of the villagers. <laughs> I can't wait to listen to this. This is incredible. You also like mushrooms, don't you? Dude. Wisdom teeth. Oh, wow. Wisdom teeth, dude. That's crazy. Yeah, I did mushrooms the night I got my wisdom teeth out, um, which they do not recommend, and I couldn't chew them, so I had to grind. I put them in a like a like a coffee grinder, I think, and I ground them up into like a powder, and had to pour them uh, down my throat, uh, which is a great length to go through to do uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms, but. I was trying to expand my horizons. <laughs> Snoop called you a thug. He did, I think, at some point. Yeah. He, he, he. <laughs> Snoop's, uh, me and Snoop get along very well. Have I, you been to his house? I've never been to his actual home. I've been to, like, his offices and things like that. I've hung out with him. Se- his office? Yeah, he has. He owns this crazy complex, like, in, uh, like, in, Kind of near Inglewood, I guess, um, like in South LA, like a giant complex where they record his show and stuff like that. And it's like Snoopland. It's it's totally crazy. God bless him. Did Snoop tell you about me? Um, I think Snoop and I talked to you about you because I talk because I love your interviews and I watch them. And there's a few people. It's funny because I grew up watching you, so I obviously like understand what you're doing. <laughs> and it's funny to see people that I have become fans of separately that interact with you, and they the 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 conflict sometimes is more apparent with others. But whenever I see someone that I like, who I can also tell appreciates you, I I talk to them about it because uh, Questlove is. So Someone else who, like, clearly, you know, you guys, you know, operate on a similar level, and so as far as just knowledge of music goes, and so, uh, yeah, we've, I've, 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 I've brought you up with, you're, you're a good icebreaker for me. <laughs> Seth, I was curious, what can you say about this rap record right here? A test pressing, Gangstar. Gangstar. What do you I think about Gangstar? Love Gangstar. We used to listen to Gangstar all the time, especially at summer camp. We would, uh, we were absolutely obsessed with Gangstar and would listen to them constantly. How do you know? this you, you are seth rogan i should know the answer to that question <laughs> that's so crazy i was curious seth what do you remember about 90s vancouver hip-hop like for instance the ragamuffin rascals Dude. as profiled in elements magazine I for sure remember the rascals i listened to them a lot they went to i want to say tupper high school and they were like the first like local uh Vancouver 
like rap group, I think probably that like made it to any, I don't know if they made it to any level of success in any way, shape or form. Uh, did they like, yeah, people, totally. Do people like know the rascals? People jack them. Are they still around? And they're not around, but the ragamuffin rascals and also the swollen members. Yeah, do you remember the members? I for sure remember the swollen members. Gross name, but good, <laughs> good group. There was a couple others. Well, there was that song, Northern Touch, which, you know, if you're a Canadian, uh, rap fan is like the be all it's like it's our stairway to heaven basically it's kind of like the be all end all of canadian rap music i think dmx stole the beat from that song just straight up for one of his songs because there is a dmx song with the exact same beat turn it turn it turn it and to Americans, I've played them the song. They're like, that's the DMX beat. I'm like, no, it's not a DMX beat. That's a fucking Northern Touch beat. But uh, yeah, and that was Rascals, Checkmate, Cardinal, and Thrust, and Chauclair coming down. I'm with down with it. Ch- <laughs> Chauclair coming down. They, they make it easy to remember who's on the song because it's the chorus of the song. <laughs> that is Elements Magazine. But I have another gift for you. Another Elements from Vancouver, from CATR, with Tribe on the cover. Oh, that's crazy. Was it here? Was, that's so... He did an interview with Tribe. What can you say about Tribe? They're tribe, my, Elements. One of my favorite rap groups of all time, uh, Tribe. I grew up listening to them. I was absolutely obsessed with them i still am wow were they they came here to vancouver they might have done a phoner for them oh, really? what do you remember about hip-hop in that era the mid-90s when you were growing up well they it was hard for rappers to get into canada and so they would cancel a lot of shows because if you have <laughs> this is gonna come out wrong <laughs> if you have some sort of criminal record often they give you a hard time getting over the border and um you know for one reason or another the groups themselves or their road <laughs> their their crew uh often was not allowed in and i remember often buying uh i think wu-tang was denied i think a few there was like a series of shows that were canceled because the rappers wouldn't be let in basically um but I uh I would go to they would have they would what, what were like there was like uh that the warp tour I think would have rappers at it sometimes I would go to that at Plaza of, was it at the Plaza of Nations outside where that casino is and the Peony Forum too Peony Forum yeah that's where you'd go see rap groups also rap shows also that's so funny Seth going all the way back to freaks and geeks yeah. did Jason get people into Rush. He kind of did, actually, and I went to a Rush concert with Jason. Uh, well, that's amazing. And and I met at the House of Blues in L.A. We met the we met the band. Uh, it was pretty it was pretty incredible. Yeah, because he had to learn like the drum. He try had to try to learn Neil Peart's uh, like drum work, which is hard to do because he has like a comically large uh, drum kit. What about Ski Patrol? The movie Ski Patrol and Paul Paul Feig. So, yeah, so Paul. Paul Feig, the guy who created Freaks and Geeks and went on to become a very successful comedy director, uh, was in the movie Ski Patrol. Uh, was that shot here in Canada? No. But when he, uh, when I auditioned for Freaks and Geeks for the first time, I like was so tripped out because... It was the guy from Ski Patrol, the Stanley. I want to say his name Stanley in the movie. And I was just like, uh, it was incredibly distracting. And I was actually shocked that I got cast because the whole time I was just like, in my head still to this day, I was just like, it's the fucking guy from Ski Patrol. Like, I remember that visceral uh, feeling of seeing him. It was so strange. My friend, Jason Margolis, tried on your varsity jacket from Freaks and Geeks. Really? Why? <laughs> he did. He just did. At director Gabe's house. Oh, that. Oh, Gabe. Yeah, Gabe sucks. He, he has everything. He took everything, and he has like uh, he he takes pictures, and he has pictures of like everything. He sent me pictures recently that I was like, whoa, like you could literally like destroy people's lives with the photos that you have his if he ever hits financial ruins a lot of people are going down because he could blackmail a lot of people winding up here with seth rogan yeah. the green hornet yes quote 
a little outdated. <laughs> yes, it was a little outdated. What's weird about... The original Green Hornet. Yeah, the original and maybe our movie. And I have a... Baboom. And I have a gift for you, a Green Hornet wow. original record. That's amazing. Is it like the... Uh, the 1930s. The yeah, the we listened to a lot of these. these this mask was so crazy and <laughs> not subtle. Uh, yeah, this... There's actually some ideas in the because when you write a movie based on a property, you get to steal anything you want from the property. And the there's actually Mike Axford, Jesus. So uh, at the end of the movie, there's a part where uh, I've the Green Hornet's been shot, and they need to figure out how to make it, how to cover up for the fact that the guy that his alter ego needs to go to the hospital, basically. And so they have it seem like Cato has tried to assassinate the Green Hornet, and that's from. One of these records, and we stole it and put it in the movie. Maybe the and people would always say, that's the best part of the movie. That's such a smart idea. I would always be like, yeah, that was written in 1933, probably. Do you have this record? Do I you... don't have this actual record. No, not at all. I have them on uh, like uh, DVD or uh, CD. I have CDs of them, but this is amazing. This is crazy. That is for you to play with the Wu-Tang picture desk. <laughs> it works the same way. That's incredible. With Seth... Rogan. With Seth Rogan. No, Seth Rogan, you went to the White House. Did you see Nixon's holes? I did see Nixon's holes. Underneath. Pause. <laughs> Pause, yes. I saw all of his holes. Underneath uh, the desks in the White House, several of them, there are still holes that were cut to remove Richard Nixon's recording equipment. And they have neither covered them nor replaced the desks. And yeah, there's like several of them that are just open, open wounds of the past, as they say. <laughs> Seth Rogen, quote, she has no more talent than a butterfly fart. Who's that? Walter Matthau on Barbara Streisand. Really? Did he say that about her? That's amazing. I didn't know that. I would disagree with that. I think, A, we don't know how much talent a butterfly fart has. B, she is very talented. They must have hated each other. That's a, Those are strong words. That's like a very creatively pieced together insult. Seth Rogen, The Interview. Yes. EW.com. Yes. The Interview Budget List. Yeah. A table of weed. Coke, pills, and panties? Those were props in a scene. I do remember they tried to make like a big deal of that, but like they were props. Like, yeah, that was there's a scene where we're doing drugs and we're partying at like a big excessive party, and so those were the types of things that were required to fit. They weren't real. <laughs> That'd be amazing if you could actually just log lie. Like maybe in the seventies you could. Have you seen that before? Um, I I was told I worked with people who like I remember Matt Dillon told me that when he was young there was cocaine at the craft service table. Like it was craft service's job to provide cocaine to the movie crew, and that was just like as they should. Yes, exactly, and that was just like accepted. And like he was like you could get mad at them if there was not enough cocaine left <laughs> like that like as though there wasn't enough water or bread or something yeah seth rogan you love coop and pettybone raymond pettybone raymond yeah raymond i do i do love raymond yes uh, we love yeah i love you art. love artwork i do love i do love art i have yeah coop i like raymond pettybone i like uh a lot of guys fail cause um street art was pretty big in vancouver when we were growing up uh and yeah, downtown had a lot of graffiti. Graffiti artists would come here. I think there was a lot of skate parks, which kind of like encouraged it as well. Um, and so yeah, I grew up. Uh, and there's a lot of like uh, Japanese culture. So I, uh, like I grew up collecting like uh, like vinyl Japanese toys and stuff like that. But yeah. Well, to walk you back to the Northwest, I thought Seth, I would give you this poster right here from the Evergreen Ballroom in Olympia, Washington. Really? The Northwest. That's it amazing. is a James Brown Whoa. poster. That's amazing. That's from crazy. the Evergreen Ballroom. Olympia, Washington, Pacific Northwest. Love James Brown. Pig's feet. <laughs> that, that was his hit song, not Kendrick's. <laughs> That's amazing. But that is for you to welcome you back Thank to Vancouver, you so the Northwest. This you know, amazing. the Northwest, because it isn't just Vancouver, is it? No, it's the whole Pacific Northwest. You, we're all, we're all it the same. It began in Seattle. It all started in Seattle. That's where I told my joke. Going to Olympia, Washington, probably, to buy Mr. Pibb with my family. <laughs> this is amazing. That is for you. Thank you so much. And lastly, Seth Rogen, what can you say about the Tremcline? Clad commercial. 
<laughs> it's a com- <laughs> it's a it's a paint commercial from the eighties, I guess, that had um a jingle that was like far too soulful for <laughs> it had no right to be that good or soulful. Um and I was obsessed with it growing up and What's funny is it was never on YouTube. There was a French version on YouTube always, because I would check like periodically. You would like, check. I would literally check to see if the trim clad commercial, as I remembered it, was on YouTube. And the best I could find was a French, the French, very version. Canadian, <laughs> exactly. And then, like, like it's like this is how like three weeks ago I checked, and finally the original English language uh, trim clad commercial was on youtube and it's an and the song was it was like scratching an itch because the song is is that good and the thing you'd like to add to the people out there seth rogan uh no i don't know thanks for having me be cool to each other (laughs) why should people care about seth rogan why should people care I don't know if they should necessarily. They probably got their own shit going on. I'm not going to tell them what where to prioritize me in their probably very complicated lives. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Seth Rogen. Keep on rocking in the free world and do 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 do.